<clears throat> you know what? We, we'll just start. See what happens. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully the sound is fine. What I do is I I I, I run them after that through a. a a compressor and limiter just to uh, equalize everything but uh um retro man cave uh neil um sir thank you very much uh for uh for coming along on this uh it was great um, i i uh, we met briefly well through uh through the the power of the internet uh recently i was on your podcast uh mm. the first ever on your channel uh which was really cool uh, really nice to be uh, to be asked and uh i had a great time actually the, the two of you uh, had a nice uh uh, a nice balance and uh, I think it went okay but you, you had a bit of bother initially you weren't sure how that was going to go because you had a lot of dislike on your channel yeah. it was a uh, very unfortunate yeah no, I appreciate you doing that Ollie um, because you did take a gamble by being our first ever guest on a podcast and we were really feeling it out with it being a new format for me and um, Andrew is my co-host so um, you made it a much better experience for us than it could have been um and uh, it's nice actually that we've done that because i feel really comfortable coming on your podcast today and it, it feels quite chilled and laid back already that we can just chat exactly yeah uh, yeah um, yeah no, it was great yeah the, the the ice was broken it's kind of hard doing these sometimes especially if i haven't talked to the other person usually i try to do it with people i've met before or talked to but uh so that that worked out fine then because this is a, you know you need to break the ice and that can take a while so for people uh, it can be a be a bit daunting in, on this podcast but yeah you, you had a lot of dislikes initially i'm just wondering like did that settle or you know how, how was the second yeah. podcast because i listened to that that was that was great i it very interesting it did settle yeah and um yeah i hope you didn't take any of that personally no because it, it was nothing to do with you as a guest i think it was more of a shock to the system for my subscribers <laughs> and i can understand why you know we're put in a completely audio only format on a video platform <laughs> so yeah no, that's not what they signed up for. So I made a little bit of a tweak with the second um, podcast just by putting a video at the start saying, this is an audio only podcast. It's on iTunes. It's on SoundCloud. It's on the Google Play Store. And then it went to the audio podcast only. And that actually was much better received just by having that little clip at the start. Um, a lot of people then just hopped over to SoundCloud and when we did that, when I put it on YouTube, all of a sudden I was watching the UK podcast charts and in the tech chart, it went up to, I think, sixth position above like BBC Click oh. <laughs> and all of these well-known podcasts. Now, admittedly, it didn't stay there for more than a couple of days. It was a real sort of spike, but it was a really good sign and it was really encouraging actually to, to prompt us to make the next one. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and what a second podcast this was. Uh, you had essentially a... A, 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 a cracker <laughs> somebody used to crack the old floppies and uh, and who, who got who got uh, well raided and and uh, had to go to court and, and all yeah, that kind of stuff exactly. very very interesting i encourage everybody to go and listen to it i'm not gonna yeah. i'm gonna spoil it here but uh, <laughs> it was it was super interesting and uh, yeah what a story i mean and what a time uh to have experienced as well i i don't know were, were you I, I, I don't know how old you are, actually. I'm, I'm taking a gamble here, but you're probably in your 30s or early 30s. Late 30s, Late yeah. Late 30s, oh, wow, okay. You've aged much better <laughs> than I have. Um, but uh, So, yeah, you, you experience all this cracking and demo scene and all that kind of stuff firsthand. Then. Yeah, the guest we had was an, a guy who's known as Beast from the group Cortex, and everyone has heard of Cortex from that era. You know, it was on... 70% of the discs that I owned, <laughs> <laughs> the crack trays. So a big, big group. Um, and he was also involved in some other groups um, as well. And he gave us some stories about how some of them dabbled in, in other crimes as well as the cracking. So it was interesting to hear how they funded themselves. Yeah, have a listen. Hopefully you can include a link to uh, send people over for a listen only. Yeah, well, we'll definitely put a link to your channel here anyway um, uh, in, the, uh, in the video description. But um, yeah, and, and where, where was, um, you said you had a few crack throws yourself as well, but what was your, what was your first system actually you had? First system, this is very timely because I get donations sent to me of systems to fix up on the channel. And one arrived today is my first system, which is in a filthy state because it still needs to be refurbished. Oh, nice. It's the old Amstrad CPC 464. So that was my first. 
and they were very kind as well in sending here is the external disk drive which i never had as a kid oh very cool three inch yeah. disk drive so that's very cool yeah a friend of mine had the the 6128 with the uh, the disk drive in it oh yeah, that's that's the one i want <laughs> that i it, they're they're not easy to find i mean i suppose i could pay over the odds on ebay for for one but yeah they're 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 tricky so, to find. I'm finding a lot of uh, Commodore 64 these days, but um, no Amstrad, I'm afraid. Uh, this one was £20 on um, a classified app called uh, Spock, or ah. Spock. I don't know if you've heard of that one. No. Um, and this was in my latest refurbishment series. So this has all been cleaned up and it was a filthy when it came in. And the drive didn't work and things like that. So we've got this working again. Um, yeah. Which yeah. kind of makes my 464 and disk drive over here redundant, but I'll give it yeah, a Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> it's not really about how practical they are. For me, actually, a lot, most of the fun is fixing them, uh, in fact. More, yeah. Probably more so than, than playing them, you know, just tweaking them, fixing them, and then uh, and then moving on to the next project. Like, actually, I have a, 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 an arcade board here um, soaking test, uh, test uh, soak testing. Mm -hmm because I just finished fixing it. And I just want to make sure that there's no uh, hidden issues, but it's actually getting sprite issues now as it's uh, it's playing. That's on so. the screen behind you there now, is yeah, it? Yeah, it's a Galaxian. Uh, I was going to say it looks like Gallagher or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Galaxian. But, uh, yeah, I saw, did you say you had, uh, you found or you wanted a, a small JAMA, uh, a, a JAMA test rig or a, a super I've gun? Got, I've, no, I've got a super gun now. I just haven't got an arcade board to put in it. <laughs> <laughs> so um yeah i'm on the lookout and the thing is every time i think of one that i really want like um i don't know say ghosts and goblins or something like that oh, you know the prices are astronomical yeah. so i think i'm just gonna have to get a really cheap one that no one wants just to <laughs> test out my super gun and see, if, see how it goes yeah you'll uh, you'll probably find with stuff like um stuff like pac-man actually is not overly expensive all things considered you, you'll find one cheap enough to fix um, and it's actually the same hardware as, uh, as Galaxian. So once you, oh, okay. you know how to fix a Pac-Man, you can uh, you know how to fix actually quite a, a good few boards after that. But uh, you, you'll find stuff if you go on uh, on UK Vac or uh, Jam Arcade, mm -hmm. UK Jam or something like that. You'd find that they have very very good uh, very good deals there as well. Yeah, it seems to be the place to go for pretty much all systems is the Facebook groups or yeah. the, the forums, isn't it? Yeah. eBay really is a last resort. The, the prices are just silly. Yeah. So I know you had, a, you had an Amiga as well. Did you ever experience the uh, Commodore 64? No, those were my Amstrad days. So, um, you know, my friends had, my friends had Spectrums. Master Systems, Acorns. Actually, I don't think any of them had a Commodore 64, which is unusual because it was such a popular system. Um, I have got a Commodore 64 now. I've got a 64C, so the newer style case. Yeah. Um, and I did a series on, on refurbishing that. In fact, they sell brand new cases for it, so it went into a brand new case, which okay. was really nice. Um, but no, 64, I didn't really use much at the time. It was all Spectrums and, and Amstrads. Um, yeah, and a couple of consoles. Yeah. But yeah, my my um, life of computers went from the Amstrad to the Amiga 500, and then it was all um, IBM PC. I got like a I started off with a Packard Bell from Dixon's, um, and then after that, every PC I, I self built once I, I got to know them a little bit better. So actually, the longest period I've had with the system is the PC. Yeah. But like many people, that the fondest memories still live with the Amiga. <laughs> Certainly, it's usually the path, isn't it? If you if you started with uh, with the home computers, you very very quickly after, especially after the 16-bit era, you moved on to a, a self-built PCs. Like I, I rarely do I see people who also had consoles or uh, or, or moved on to consoles after having a home computers. Like it's, there's a a clear separation in hobbies, it seems, like a, in in what is seen as a common hobby, like retro gaming or retro computing, or but it was there was a clear separation at the time, uh, I remember. But um, so you have now a retro man cave channel that's going quite well, actually. It's it's in a year, it's uh, it's jumped quite drastically. Uh, I discovered your channel, I think it was the. Uh, 
the Amiga restoration, the Trash to Treasure. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's what prompted a lot of people to discover your channel as well, because that did quite well, that series. It did, and I think for whatever reason, one of the episodes YouTube featured it. There's no rhyme or reason as to why they do it. It's all witchcraft as to how YouTube promotes stuff. But one of those episodes, and I, actually, I think I even got a pop-up on the app on my phone saying your video's been featured by YouTube. Wow. And I was fairly new to YouTube. I hadn't used it a lot by that point, And I just thought, oh, it's just another notification. <laughs> <laughs> so it was only a couple of months later when I was like, well, why has that video been so popular? And um, yeah, that was why. So I've never repeated that. I've never had anything featured again. But uh, it certainly got the views up. And a lot of people did see that um, Amiga series. And I think it came across in that series, you know, the love that I had for the machine and the connection that I had to, to the machine. Um, it was it was a lot more than just a repair. It really was me revisiting the system after many, many years and getting to know it again, yeah. Wow. And of course you have all of those amazing soundtracks to go with the Amiga songs that you can put across that series, you know. So much great music from the Amiga. Yeah. I was right uh, in the middle myself when I saw the video. I was right in the middle of, uh, of fixing my own uh, my own Amiga, which I still have, my old Amiga. And uh, so it was funny, like that's when I discovered your video as I was fixing my uh, my Amiga. So that was really, uh, really cool, fortunate as well. And um, and uh, yeah, it, 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 it's just, it's reassuring in a way to see that YouTube features stuff like that because a lot of, a lot of people despair, sort of despair, especially if you're somewhere artistic or DIY minded or or you run something that's not like boisterous or, or overly loud and in your face, you know, it's it seems to be what, what works these days. And uh, I always refuse to do anything like that myself. <laughs> I just, I, I cannot bring myself to doing it. So it's nice to see somebody who has a, 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 a channel like yours, who's essentially very soft and quiet and and uh, and uh, and um, all about you know the the uh, the well doing stuff yourself and diy and fixing and the hardware it's just nice to see that it's getting some interest uh, along the channels of you know like the 8-bit guy and and uh, lgr and uh, uh it's lovely to see like I'm, I'm delighted for you that the channel is doing well and it it it, it keeps uh, it keeps growing Yes, thank you. Yeah, no, it is nice. And I don't have a hoverboard and I don't vlog yeah. and I don't, <laughs> and I don't, yeah, I don't shout at the camera. It's quite a calm place to be. And it's strange because I did start out trying to be like that. I think you take your cues from other channels, yeah. or at least I did when I started out. And I wanted to be like the angry video game nerd and I wanted to be <laughs> shouty and, you know, and you just can't force that. I just, no. After reflecting on a few videos I'd made, it was just like, no, this isn't me. I can't keep that up. That's a, just a complete character. And I just slipped into being the way I am. So, yeah, you know, the calmness um, is comes completely natural to me. It's just, it's just the guy I am. Um, I do get angry sometimes. There are some games that are worth getting angry over. <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> it tends to happen off camera. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 great to see. I, I think I think most people on YouTube go through the same sort of route at some point. You know, you try things and you, you try to mimic what you see is working and all that, and you inevitably, inevitably revert to just yourself, essentially. You know, um, and it, I I see it a lot, especially in in stuff like arts or like music or, or visual art and that kind of stuff. People just trying different stuff that they know is going to be popular and they do it for a while and I've seen a lot of uh, uh, video game music uh, channels actually just burning out essentially saying okay I, uh, I can't do these musics that I have no interest in or I can't do these uh, videos that I don't really like myself it's just uh, I see people burning out and stopping or just reverting to why they started YouTube in the first place so it's nice to uh, yeah, yeah, you obviously have to have a genuine interest in it to keep it up. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also important to bring something valuable to YouTube in terms of or originality. Um, yeah. It's very easy to just take gameplay footage, and there's nothing wrong with taking gameplay footage if you can commentate on it and make it entertaining. Um, I, I struggle to just play a game and make it entertaining, which is why I have things like the set here. And, you, you know, I like to get the actual equipment out 
and try and film it in a almost cinematic way to bring something original and to make it a little bit different from the other channels. Um, you don't have to do a lot, but I think just a, just a little bit extra uh, can make a channel stand out like that. Um, and uh, I think, um, but I, it, I, yeah, it can't be forced though. It has to come naturally, you know. Yeah. Well, well, I'm sure people come to you and ask you for tips on starting a YouTube channel. And mine is always just make a video, just do it. Just get yeah. something out there and laugh at your mistakes and reflect on them and let it evolve naturally. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've I've done recently on my uh, other channel, I've done a, a small vlog where I ins essentially answer that because I do get asked a lot, uh, people who want to, they're musicians themselves and they're, they're asking me tips on starting your own channel and all that. And I'm always like, just start, start now, start yesterday. It just don't try to look for a formula, just start something and then tweak it you know evolve it or, or let it evolve naturally to reflect who you are as a musician or or as a gamer but it's uh, it's it, it, because yeah my answer was like do it for the right reasons not because you obviously want views and all that but because you want to people to see what you do um, yeah. Uh, and not you, not getting people to see you for the sake of seeing you, but you do something and 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 put it out so people can see it. That's yeah. always been my answer, um, as opposed to trying to get popularity. But because if you don't put it up, nobody will see it. And if if only five, ten people see it, that well, that's five and ten more than yesterday. Yeah. You know. Um, so my my answer is always just start. Don't worry about whether it's quality or well. Obviously, you want quality, but don't worry. Uh, whether it works straight away or not. Yeah, and it's always, with me, it's always the video that you least expect that gets the, the best feedback, yeah. most views. So once you get out there, those comment sections are really valuable in helping you to pick out what you should do more of and less of. So yeah, absolutely. But one other advantage I have in the kind of videos I make is that I can quite easily collaborate with other people. But it, as a musician, for you, it must be fairly difficult to collaborate over youtube unless you can get them in the same room i don't know you not, tell me. not really no you can uh, it's it's actually surprisingly easy nowadays um all you just need to you know, obviously be on the same music page um but if you if you can work like uh, the, the the i can't read music so i can't write music but i can make a midi file for them so that's usually how i work you know i i either send them a midi file or request one and then and then you, you kind of you work back and forth. Sometimes it works the first time round, actually surprisingly often. Um, sometimes it, it it doesn't need a bit of tweaking. But uh, you know it's actually quite easy. It's quite easy. You just you you agree on. Obviously you get the MIDI file. You agree on the on the on the tempo, and then you work separately, and then the magic of editing puts it together. You know. Okay, you make it sound I'm sure easier than it really is, but um, <laughs> but I think that I think that collaborating is really important, um, a really important part of YouTube, and certainly when I started out, I was really surprised by some of the bigger YouTubers actually coming to me and offering to collaborate and helping to promote the channel. Um, so that's also something that I try to pass on to smaller YouTube channels, and I've appeared on a few recently, and I've got a few guests appearing on upcoming episodes. Um, and I think that's all part and parcel of being a YouTuber. You know, it really can't be a one-way street. It has to be, uh, you have to ingrain yourself in the community and be a part of it. You can't just take, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And I, uh, when I collaborate, bar one collaboration, but most people have collaborated with were much smaller channels than mine, mm -hmm. you know, by a, a factor of 10 or something like that. So it's it's clearly not for the views, like my, my first interest is serving the tune, you know, and serving the music. So uh, if I know somebody that ha will do the job perfectly, and I don't care whether they have a big or a small channel, like it's it's mm -hmm. the music always comes first for me. So or the end results, you know, uh, in this case, but it's funny, though, because I, I say that and then at the same time, I always say for me, it's the process of making. I don't know how you stand as because we do obviously different content. Um, but uh, uh, for me, it's the, it's the process of making the video and, and making it happen. And once it's done, that's it, you know, I move on. Like, it's of no interest to me, really, the finished product. Yeah. But uh, how, how does it work for you as a, as, I, I don't know, how would you describe your channel to start with? <laughs> it's uh, reviews, <laughs> yes. reviews, it's 
it's yeah it's, um, well it, first and foremost it is a channel and this is how I came how I came to have an audio podcast on it because I, I think a channel should have a, a mixture of different programs on it just like any TV channel right. so I try not to get cast into one single genre or format um, and I'd say that the main types of content I make at the moment are the trash to treasure series which you mentioned which is when I get an old computer and we um, uh, we tear it down give a tour of it and fix it up and that can take place over two, three, four, five episodes. That can be a long process depending on, on how bad it is. Um, I do the podcast, I do hardware reviews, um, and kind of like historical documentaries sometimes. So there was a, I think it was about a half hour long episode about the Soviet Union or former Soviet Union and how they cloned the ZX Spectrum and just the popularity of that, which was a world I'd never known about before. I just came across a clone spectrum and thought, well, what's this? And it just opened up this whole world of right. clone ZX spectrums across the Soviet Union and ended up being did, an episode. Did MSX as well computers and did all They had MSXs, yeah, yeah. they had um, Dendi uh, cloned NESs, um, they had Subal was another. In fact, this is in front of me. I'm making an episode on, on this at the moment. So this... What is that? Looks like a keyboard. Yeah, it looks like a PC keyboard, doesn't it? It's, um, it's actually a Famiclone. Oh. So, <laughs> um, in fact, I'll show you the book. So this is an episode I'm making at the moment that will be out later this week. I don't know if you recognize that guy. It's Jackie Chan. Oh, wow. So <laughs> it's um, a family educational computer promoted by Jackie Chan. Oh, did I see somebody gifting that to... Was it Andrew? Uh, that was gifted to me oh. by um, Naomi, who's known as Sexy Cyborg. That's right, yes. And Serpent ZA. So they're two big YouTubers, and that goes back to the point of helping other YouTubers out. They've got like 600,000 subscribers between them. Wow. They came to me and said, we want to send you this computer, we want you to do an episode, and we want to help you promote it. So, wow, that's so nice. Yes, yeah, so, so nice. Um, so that's where that's come from. So that was a bit like um, the Russian one, a, a kind of a documentary format. So, uh, you know, the strap line at the top of the channel is like new adventures in old technology, old adventures with new technology. So we also cover things like the Raspberry Pi, using new tech to, you know, play old games, things like that, Bluetooth controller reviews, anything and everything really that, uh, to be honest, pops into my head. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I want to learn more about that. And then I just share the experience and um, it's it's honest and it's inquisitive. And I think that comes across as well. It's me exploring these things inquisitively in a, in a calm way. And um, I think that comes across and people seem to enjoy it so far, yeah. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why do we do it? But yeah, but you know what I mean? It's, 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 why do we like fixing these things and restoring them so much? It's not so much about owning them for me. It's really about restoring them to life and, and fixing them. What, no. what is it in that? that? Yeah, it's the challenge, isn't it? It's, it's working out problems and working through it. Um, my background is not in electronics. That's, in yeah. fact, probably one of my weakest skills. And anyone who's trained in electronics will watch my videos and go, he's not, he's not trained. He's, L you know, likewise. feeling his way around it. Likewise, I'm not. Uh... And um, my background is working in IT, but more on the software side of things, solving problems. So I've got the best part of 20 years of problem solving you know, software basis and on applications, servers, networks, things like that. Uh, and I think that works into you, a natural desire to solve problems and a logical way of thinking. And all I'm doing is applying that to the old systems now and just trying to work through. Here's the challenge, it doesn't work. It's something that has a huge amount of nostalgia for me. Even if I didn't own it the first time round, I can appreciate the nostalgia that other people would have for it. And I want to fix that. How do I do it? And at the end result, I may well have a system that I don't turn on again for a few months. Yeah. You know, it's done. It, the challenge is completed. Um, but I've shared that experience, and yeah, I think like you said, you you kind of you finish the video, and with, yeah, with the trash to treasures, 
I'll start the video, I'll get, for example, this Amstrad and I'll go, oh, this looks terrible. We might plug it in and go, it doesn't turn on and I'll give everyone a tour and I say, okay, and now I'm gonna fix this in episode two. <laughs> and I turn the camera off and I go, oh shit, I've got no, to fix got this. To <laughs> So I also put myself under a lot of pressure to actually fix these machines. And um, we get there eventually. You know, we've had a few bent space bars and things like that along the way where it hasn't quite gone right. Um, but I do share those mistakes. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, that, that probably hasn't answered your question why, other than, yeah, there's an immense amount of satisfaction that no, comes I, I, from having it fixed at the I, end of it, yeah. Actually, you have answered it um, in the same way I answer it as well, uh, which is it's it's a problem-solving exercise. And um, for the, the covers I do on the, my music channel, I always say it are, is a problem-solving exercise. I decide to do a tune and now I have a problem. I need to do that tune. How do I replicate those sounds? How do I put the arrangement together so that it doesn't denature the tune and, and keeps, you know, and, and is, is different and driving enough, but yet uh, it's very similar. You want to keep the, the original tune intact. So it's, it's I, uh, I describe it as a problem solving exercise. It's, it's sculpting in a way. Yeah. Now, I, I don't know if this applies to you, but for me, the act of putting the camera on and filming myself doing it yeah. slows me down, slows me right down. I'm a lot more patient on camera than I am yeah. in person. And I make a lot less mistakes because I'm filming it and because I'm thinking everything through six times before I actually do it. So the whole filming process actually makes me better at fixing things. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, because you you have just you have to be a lot more deliberate and and you can't just re replace every part and <laughs> hope no. it'll work at the end. Yeah, yeah. It <laughs> has to be satisfying for the viewer as well as yeah. me. Yeah. So this doesn't work. So I bought another one and I'm just going to swap the motherboard out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. Do you know that's what? <laughs> I, I this afternoon I, f I finished fixing uh, uh, I had um, a Commodore 64 bread bin that just wasn't booting and I, uh, I, I my plan was to actually show the uh, restoration and get it um, working on a camera which is what I do on the other channel and then I started working on it I, I filmed some of it and then I got way too into it and um, I forgot to film <laughs> <laughs> and essentially what I ended up doing is fixing it and forgot to film and I fixed a few things there was some RAM issues and the PLA was gone and uh, the VIC was fried as well I mean um, so I ended up actually just fixing replacing so many parts and then halfway I was like oh, you know what fuck it I'm, I'm gonna put sockets on everything and use that as a test board afterwards you know so uh, that's what I ended up doing so now I have a Commodore 64 that's working which is great I, I forgot to film it <laughs> but I bet, I bet in the act of forgetting to film it, you fix that five times faster than you would have if you were worrying about the camera. Oh, probably. Well, sh I shotgunned everything, though, so uh, yeah. It's <laughs> but um, yeah, and going back to my approach, I think because I'm not trained and because I deliberate over everything, um, I get lots of nice messages from people saying that I've given them the confidence to try it themselves because they can follow what I'm doing. And... I explain it when I explain something um, in electronics that I haven't done before. Being able to explain it on video yeah. affirms to me that I actually understand what I'm talking about. If I can't explain it, then I don't understand it. Yeah. So that's also a, a nice part of the process as well. Yeah. What, what's the expression? If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough, or something exactly. like that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm the same. I, a lot of it I figure out as I'm filming or as I'm fixing, which is great and as you like you say it, it just it allows you to actually explain it in in layman's terms because essentially that's what we are we're not trained in electronics so exactly yeah. but the beauty is you have 30 years of previous experience to call upon from other people yeah groups from you know you know from forums so the answer's there it's just a question of finding it yeah i was fixing those um, those um, galaxian boards which is that's one of them here um, that's actually a, a, a clone of Galaxian, sorry. Okay. That's actually a, a, a bootleg, sorry, of Galaxian, but the hardware is identical, so you can take the schematics from a Galaxian board and it works. And, uh, and I, I was surprised actually how much there is online. It's got pretty much every issue that could be 
wrong with the board uh, and it says you know if the sprite is off here or is slightly too high this is this chip and if yeah. uh, th this color appears this is this chip like there like you said there's 30 years of experience and and people who have documented stuff uh, that is actually nowadays quite i wouldn't say simple but it's a lot easier than it, it, it was before yeah yeah absolutely there, there was, is, yeah. sorry no go ahead no, it is. I was just going to say, um, is that a Z80 based, that Galaxian? That's, yeah, that's a Z80 yeah. board. Uh, you got the Z80 here. Mm -hmm. um, got this one has, has no ROM. The, the proms here are missing. There's a lot of stuff missing with this one, but it's the same as the other one. So hopefully I'll, I'll get it fixed as well. But um, what, what, what um, amazes me is the people who figure this out. Um, back then, re, you know, reverse engineered all this stuff and documented it because the, uh, th there wasn't documentation for them to use. And it's the same when you're talking about games of that time, mm -hmm. you know, coded in Assembler or on the ZX Spectrum, or uh, th there was th there was so little documentation available. Mm -hmm. uh, I was talking to David Wise about it a while back, and he said we just had to figure out how to do it and what to do. He said, now, you know, years and years after uh, stuff like trackers came along for, for musicians, but he said when he started, there was no tracker. It was all the X code. They had to uh, send uh, directly into uh, into the NES at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I've heard some great stories from people like Rob Hubbard of um, yeah. just how little memory they were assigned, yeah. you know, to put, to put their music into, and not just the music, also the player to make the music play in between the other you know the, the game loop to allow the game logic yeah. And, um yeah very interesting how they figured that all out yeah i sometimes wish i'd been born a decade earlier <laughs> so that i could have been a part of that process but there you go i do what i can now <laughs> but w would we have though because like like we said there, there just wasn't a documentation like I, either you were part of a, a gang that had access to knowledge or you weren't and you were pretty much screwed because there was no libraries that had this stuff. There was no internet to uh, look for it. Like it was all. Yeah. Things like the ZX Spectrum, I get the impression that what a lot of people did, like um, say the Oliver Twins, for example, they would just poke every single part of the memory, see what it did. And they would just <laughs> write yeah. down, right, if we poke into this part of the memory, it has this effect and just slowly build up their own library of, um, you know, cause and effect and then write functions from that to take advantage yeah. of them. It really was that laborious, I think. Yeah. Had you a few friends or a small network of uh, of like-minded people at the time? Not really. No, I grew up in a sleepy town in Dorset on the south coast of England, and um, had a few friends with computers, but they were mostly into football, riding their BMXs, you know, that sort yeah. of thing. So it was quite a solitary hobby, um, and that's also been. A nice part of YouTube is to to be a more of a part of a community. And thirty years too late, share <laughs> those experiences with other people. Um, not really until I came to college, and then I did study computer science at college. So I was with some more like-minded people there, um, and that was a fun experience. But we never got together. I know that you got your head together with some friends and had like a, um, a demo making group. Yeah, but you didn't release anything, um, and. You know, we came up with our own little games, which we wrote at college in C and Pascal and things like that. And, just, and for a while, there was that sense of trying to outdo each other. You know, I've written this new sprite routine that looks better than yours. Yeah. And that was just, you know, for a few months at college between a few people. So I can really see how that would scale up into a games industry if you were going head to head with other people for your livelihood, you know, that as much as anything would have accelerated your code writing and yeah. your, uh, you know, the advancements in these machines. Um, and then from there, I went to uni and did uh, software engineering uh, and management, and went more towards the management than the software engineering side <laughs> when I went into a job. So, um, <clears throat> yeah. But this was way after those eight-bit days, even the sixteen-bit days. This was all on PCs. Um, I think my coding experience, the 16 bits, probably goes back to Amos on the Amiga. Oh yes, remember that. Yeah, um, that was a very, that was a very, very powerful 
little basic application. It was great, I yeah. Guess, yeah. yeah. Um, but Good. nothing nothing really on the 8-bit. So I never really had to dive into Assembler, you know. Yeah. I, I moved on to the PCs and there was always enough RAM yeah. for what I was doing. There was always enough processing power. So um, it yeah. stopped being fun after that. <laughs> it did start, yeah. Again, the challenge, the problem solving. Yeah. You know, when you're told to make something in Visual Basic, it's too easy. Yeah, I was talking to Barry Leach actually in a previous episode. That's a plug, folks. Um, and <laughs> but he was saying that what you were saying earlier on actually that the they'd meet every week or every odd few days, but with a new somebody had a new routine that outdid what the other guy was doing. So it was all about pushing each other and that kind of way. Um, but we were talking about the the challenge itself and the uh, the problem solving exercise again, like you were saying, you know, having to make music in only three channels or four channels you know and and how do you go around and how, you know how many cycles have you available and uh, and yeah it was uh, it, it was it was just super super interesting i, I find it was just genuinely because when you whenever you 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 made people forget that i don't know the amiga only had four channels we only because at the time it sounded like a lot but uh, when you make people forget that the enemy only had four channels suddenly like it was just uh, such an achievement you know yeah uh, and then some people went on and, and put eight channels in the Amiga like uh, <laughs> but, hey, like Chris Hulsbeck yeah on Turrican yes yeah. yeah but um you you're I believe you're you're also a, a, a family man and married and a father or no, 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 no. I thought, okay. No, this is all vicious rumors. I don't know oh, who's fair been enough. No, I thought you told me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, um, I have a girlfriend called Lily who I live with, um, and she was very pleased to see me move the cave to this building. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is not where I live. This is, a, this is an office that I rent and I do my day job okay. in here at the other end of the office. So originally the cave started out in my spare room and... Um, that's now her sewing room, so she's very, very pleased to have that. <laughs> yeah, no children I, to speak of, no. No, sorry, yeah. no, me neither. But uh, yeah, no, it, it's interesting though, being a YouTuber in your late thirties or, in my case, early forties. But um, how, how different do you feel it is compared to, I don't know, somebody in their twenties? I, I see a lot of YouTubers starting and getting quite big on YouTube, and then almost stopping overnight because I don't know, college is over and they have to find a job or they just find it mm. too hard to do both while they have to work. And uh, whereas if I do feel we have a, probably a slight uh, advantage that will probably see us, you know, doing this in the long run, in the sense that we, we've sort of already found a balance in our lives in general and, uh, yeah. uh, and, uh, and uh, adjusted to uh, having a full-time job and a family to a, uh, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Um, I, when I left uni, um, I was never out of work and it was always in very corporate places mm. for the best part of 20 years, very corporate, um, striving for the next promotion, the next pay rise, et cetera, et cetera. And that all ended about a year, two years ago when I was part of a merger that fell apart between two companies. So it was an American company I was working for, really great company, and they merged with a French company. And um, I moved to Paris for a year and worked for the, for the French company. And the merger between the Americans and the French fell apart. And it was quite a, a rough experience when you've committed yourself to move to another country, yeah. for a company, you know, you're really throwing everything at it. And when that didn't work out, it left me feeling quite deflated and going, okay, I need a break from the corporate life. I've given my all and it's, you know, it hasn't worked for me this time. So I'm coming from that background and then moving into YouTube, which is not my full-time job. I then moved to some graphic design work. So that sort of pays the bills, but increasingly YouTube is becoming, um, or is showing the potential of becoming my full-time job. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to what you're saying, being a little bit older, I have that prior experience to look at it on balance and go yeah. way up the risks. How much effort do I need to put into this? I don't want to burn myself out. I don't need to make seven videos a week. Yeah. Quality over quantity. You know, yeah, I think you do have the experience to measure all of these things up 
does this content really have long-term appeal? You know, how long is the nostalgia bubble going to inflate for? Um, and how much am I prepared to commit to it with my other commitments? Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying. I don't have an answer to a lot of those questions because I'm still trying to figure out a lot of them as I go. I, and me neither. I, I really don't... <laughs> It wasn't really a question, actually. It was just probably just a floating statement. But it, it was. Yeah. I I do have a sense that. I don't know. I I often see people saying that they don't have the energy for doing a video because they came back from work and it's they're tired or you know or whatever. And then I'm like, well, you know, it's I I work <laughs> eight hours a day in the corporate environment and then. And, and, and I don't know, the first thing I want to do when I come back is, well, first exercise, but also, um, uh, yeah, it work on on, uh, on some music and on the channel, like it's... What is it that you do in your in your day job, Ollie? I'm a developer. Okay, so, so developer, yeah. yeah, so switching from that to doing something musical must be a really nice sort of switch in your in your brain, or do you, do you liken them to each other in their thought? I program? very much liken them to each other. Do I, you? I, um, uh, I did a I did a video actually an interview for a, for a gallery painting gallery back because I was a sort of semi part time painter for ages and ages and uh, I was talking about music and painting and surfing at the time um, and I, I I said it it I I do equate them in the sense that it you just find that little zone in your your headspace and programming is very much the same you just find that headspace where it's just you that other thing you're focused on and nothing else exists for that amount of time um yeah and i i uh yeah so they're 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 not dissimilar even though the obviously the end result is completely different but the what yeah. what, what it, it brings you and the state of mind you have to be in to do these uh is very very similar so you still have the headspace at the end of your eight hour day to go and do what you consider me to be quite similar then. That's why I go exercise, because I, I need ah, to get the okay. frustration out first. And then you've still got time after that and then, to I, go I, and I, do your exercise. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I do a lot of like martial arts and stuff like that. So that's, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great, uh, it's, a, it's not entirely dissimilar either. It's a, it's a, just areas where you have to focus 100% and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I do. I can't rest anyway, so I don't know. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I have a hard time. I understand what you're saying. I use running for the same reason. I like to go running and get into that. Head yeah, space. yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, running is yeah. very yeah. Definitely. And you have to as well. You can't just you, you, you know you, you can't just be focused on your legs and how bad your heart is aching when you're running. You have to be in a certain headspace and and be in your zone. Yeah, absolutely. I've tried to listen to podcasts while running, and I just can't. I just got to get into that zone. I can't listen. Oh, really? Yeah. Podcasts. No, music's fine, but no, not podcasts. I just need to get in the zone. Yeah. Not that you could tell from my figure. <laughs> it's interesting. So you you have your old setup in your off well, obviously um, office. Yeah. Wow, that's that's really handy. So it's a it's a basement office. Um, it's a very short walk from where I live, my my little flat, which is really nice not to have to commute in a car every day. And um, because it's a basement office, nobody else wanted it. There's no sunlight that comes in here. Mm -hmm. There's no heating. <laughs> <laughs> so I was able to get it for a very, very reasonable price. And that somewhat helped as well by Patreon. I've, I've somehow oh, yeah. accumulated a really nice following on Patreon um, for people who appreciate what I do for whatever reason. So that is probably what made me take the step to actually rent somewhere and gave me the confidence, again, that this could go somewhere that's self-sustaining um, was the Patreon support, yeah. W would that be your goal, ultimately? Is that something you'd like to do full-time YouTube? Yeah, I'm not going to lie. I would love to do it full-time. Yeah. Um, at the moment, I do, I do my full-time job in the same office and I'm constantly looking down at this end of the office going, I just want to work on that computer now. So to be able to come in and just do that all day, every day would be amazing. But I know it's also a dangerous thing, you know, they say yeah. not make your hobby into your job. Uh, hopefully, you know, I won't ruin my hobby. Yeah. Um, I'm, but, in, I'm in two minds about it uh, myself. I, um, like, because like you said, you know, th then it becomes a job and not a hobby anymore. I went. I went playing. I, I've said that a few times there on this podcast. But I, I, I became a musician full time for a while, years and years ago, 
and uh, hated it. I hated it. Um, it no. was a different setup, though, because especially when you're a pub musician, I was playing traditional music, and it just you know, it's it's a hard it's a hard life. Um, you, you live at night. Uh, I suppose on YouTube it would be very very different, but yeah, I don't think it would be too big a jump because I already have a number of patrons. I I already have an obligation to provide them with content. You know, obviously, well, I don't have to. If I don't, they'll stop supporting me. But, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. so if I went full time, I don't think a huge amount would change. I still have the same pressures to supply them with content and to entertain them ultimately. So um, I don't think it would be too different now. Patreon, again, I say it a lot, but Patreon is probably the single best way to support any creator um, uh, because we can't just rely on YouTube anymore. Ad revenue is. No, very no. negligible I mean yeah even for uh, uh, we're still small channels but even you know even for channels that have over 20 or 30,000 subscribers it just it's not um, working mm -hmm. model for a lot of the channels that I watch now they get to a point with their Patreon where they actually set the goal as I will no longer have adverts on YouTube videos yeah. because it's just it's just not worth it to them yeah. they just get enough from it and it gives a better experience to the viewer not to have those adverts so um, yeah but uh, I don't know about you but I'm a long way off being able to turn my adverts off or they don't get a lot but they keep the lights on yeah yeah exactly yeah no it, it, it pays for the sandwiches for sure yeah but um yeah no it's it's it it's funny because i i enjoy my job as well so I, it would have to be i would have to literally match my salary and then some um uh, which is a, a very very long way off and i can see that happen um, yeah uh, but it, yeah I, 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 you have to you have to earn a lot on patreon to even consider it when you take taxes into account, you know, exactly, yeah. <laughs> when you take taxes into account and everything else, yeah, yeah, you, you've got to earn a lot. Yeah, look, plus, like, I, I mean, I've been working in this company for a long, long time. It's a big, a big corporate company. I've, I have very nice advantages and, um, you know, healthcare and things like that. Then suddenly you have to take into account, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I, I'll be looking to get a mortgage soon to to buy a house and quite what the bank manager is going to make of patreon income <laughs> yeah that's mortgage. interesting isn't it i really don't think he's gonna yeah, consider that so um we'll see what happens there yeah <laughs> I, I'd, I'd love to talk to um uh, uh, you know pat dns punk no he, I don't. he runs a, a channel anyway but um uh, he's quite a big youtuber but he actually got a mortgage off whatever patreon and you know that kind of stuff uh, he's a YouTuber, and that's all he does. And uh, I, I'd love to know what the the bank manager told him and how how he had to angle that. You know, it'd, it'd be yeah. interesting. Uh, yeah, I'm curious because here I, I don't know about the UK, but in Ireland they'll just laugh at you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Now, I have I have a low risk income, would they? <laughs> yeah, I have I have a mortgage anyway, so uh, ah. I, I don't need to worry about that part. I just need to worry about paying it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll just have to push the other half to get a promotion and <laughs> maybe a kept man. <laughs> but uh, well, you were saying you know people donate a lot of their stuff to uh, to the channel, like with you and the channel. Like, how much of your collection then is donations? Oh, uh, probably more than seventy percent of it. Wow, huge yeah. amount, huge amount. And it's sort of self-fulfilling. The reason the, the CPC 464 arrived was because I was making a series on a 6128. You know, as soon as I start making a series about something, people start commenting, I've got this game, I've got yeah. this accessory, do you want it? And um, I try to be careful about what I accept. Um, if I've already got something, I generally say no unless it's something that has a really bad reputation and then i might go okay i'll have two i'll have a spare you know have an extra chip set wouldn't go yeah, on this yeah. um but i don't like to hoard so generally I, I do say no to a lot of things politely um and i try to show my appreciation for the donations in a monthly or nearly monthly donations video where i show everything that's come in give people an idea of what i may or may not do with the item um, but yeah, a lot of donations. And it's funny, I was just yesterday, I was trying to find an old comment I made on the 8-Bit Guys videos. It must have been about 14 months ago. And it was one of his donations videos, and I just started and I made a comment that said, 
I wish people would donate stuff to me. And that, that was it. And I want to go back and find that and frame it and stick it on my wall. <laughs> you should be careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> I've been I've been very very fortunate. I've been given a ton of stuff. Um, that, that Commodore sixty four box and all the games on top here. Yeah. Uh, that was all donations um, from people. And I posted. Um, I found a bread bin Commodore sixty four in a flea market recently, and somebody then, I think within hours of me putting it on Facebook, somebody sent me a message that. I have this Commodore 64 as well with the uh, the floppy drive which I have here. And not this one, yeah. but another one yet. So I ended up with like four Commodore 64, you know, after buying just one. Um, yeah, a lot of it, probably 70% as well of my collection yeah. is donations. Um, um, and you get some nice stories with the donations as well. Um, yeah. There's a CD32, I, I was sent um, some joy pads and some games for the CD32. And they came from some guy's late father's collection, and he just said he knew he wanted it to come to a place where it'd be looked after, you know, wow. rather than selling it on eBay. Yeah. So, and it and it will be looked after. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's the same. Like people, people see that you know you have an interest, and you, you mine those machines and repair them, and they, they, they've they've been keeping them but not playing them at all. They don't want to sell them. They don't want to give them away, and then see somebody who who they know will appreciate it, and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and I, I yeah I try to share that appreciation on YouTube. I would love someday to have an opportunity to lay them all out, set them all up, and let people come and actually use them. You know, almost like a museum. Yeah, there's certainly not the space for that here. So maybe one day. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe partner with a a, a, a convention or something like that. And yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Or even local event. Um, do you go to many conventions at all? I went to my first retro convention uh, in Blackpool at the Play Expo, which was earlier this year, start of this year, or, yeah, start of this year. Um, yeah, that was an experience, partly because the hotel that the expo was in was like Colditz Castle. It was, <laughs> it was incredible, nice. falling to pieces. But um, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> the people were lovely. They had. Um, loads and loads of arcade cabinets set up, something that I hadn't seen for a very long time, all the old classics. Yeah. So I got to play on a sit run, sit down outrun yeah. and Robotron and things like that. That was awesome. Um, and also um, I had the strange experience of being recognized and people coming and saying hello to me, which um, hasn't uh, happened yeah. before since. Obviously, there's a concentration of that community in one place who may recognize me. But um, yeah, it was really nice to, to chat to people who watch. And actually that had quite an impact on me because I'm always chucking these videos out there. It was the first time where, you know, somebody looked me in the face and said, thank you, I really enjoy your videos. And it, it was quite moving really to see that people are entertained and they enjoy the content. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm incredibly always humbled and a bit awed by when people tell you, you know, thank you for your videos. And I'm like, well, no, thank you for watching them. And no, no, thank you for your videos. I'm like, oh, really? What did you say? <laughs> um, yeah, it's yeah, the comment section. Yeah, folks, you have no idea, you know, the effect the comments have on the, on the, on creators. It's just, it's the nicest thing to get. And uh, when somebody tells you, you know, thank you, you've made my day better. Well, now you've made my day better. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, or when I hear somebody said, they started the banjo because of the channel or or, yeah. or they, they were used to play the banjo they, they hated it and now they want to start it again because they realize you can do something else with it or whatever it just it makes it really makes my day mm -hmm. um, I remember it's funny what you said about DX but were you there as a guest or uh, as no a, no I paid for my tickets and gone as a punter yeah I, I went to the retro world expo in Connecticut we we were on holidays there, and then we, with a retroware, the, the group I was, um, well, I'm still part of. Um, uh, they, they, well, they, they got me in as a guest. It's actually, I didn't have to pay for the ticket. That was more, you know. But I didn't have. A, I was part of their panel, but I didn't have a, a booth or anything like that. But they, there was a, other YouTubers there. I don't know if you know the Game Chasers and Norm mm -hmm. and anyway. So I was just, I was literally just queuing to meet them because that was the first time, you know, I was there. Uh, so I was queuing in the line to meet them, so I was in this line here, and uh, it was uh, my, my wife and I, Fiona, and and then at some point she goes, Ollie, what's going on, like, you know, to your right? So <laughs> what do you mean? So I turn to my right, and there's another queue that's per 
perpendicular, <laughs> moving <laughs> in the same direction. But and I turn around and said, "Can I help you?" And somebody goes, oh, "Are you are you Banjo Gaioli?" I said, "Like yeah." <laughs> Um, so and it was a queue of people who the queue had formed around yeah, f- wow. from, so there was a queue within the queue it was just the weirdest thing like so I arrived at the the game chase to me then and I said um, actually sorry I, I gotta <laughs> let, I have to let people pass now because now I'm busy yeah it was just it was it was really odd I didn't expect that I don't seek it I I, I, no. I, I, I don't know I don't think I'm, I'm gonna guess n- neither do you but it's always nice no no I don't it's, it was nice to um, yeah it, it was nice for that appreciation and just to just to, it's very different to the comments section on YouTube it's always nice to get a thank you yeah. on the comment section and I always respond to people who say nice things you know I spend a lot of time replying to comments and um, yeah that you know i think there must be a level as a youtuber where you can't actually reply to all the comments you know you must get to that point um but i'm not there yet so i always try to say thank you but actually in person it meant so much more yeah yeah Yeah, it was it was lovely and it was also nice to meet some other youtubers in the same genre and, and chat to them about their experiences as well um and nicely the nice the nice thing about blackpool was one or two but most of them weren't there to make videos they were just there to enjoy the event um so that was nice did sort of really feel like i yeah. caught on some downtime and really chat to them one to one yeah I, I i find conventions draining though yeah, they, they really are they, they really take a toll on you um well i made sure not to stay at the convention i booked a hotel down the road so i could <laughs> get away from it you know whenever i needed to yeah. <laughs> if it got too much yeah, I, I went through a phase. I was going to go to as many as I could, and then I think I went to one. When well, I went to two, and I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know. I don't think I can socialize to that extent either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's the most socializing I do here. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't come naturally. You know, my my natural habitat is on my own in the cave here, yeah. not not shaking hands at conventions, but. Um, you know, yeah. once or twice a year is fine, I think. How do you handle the uh, negative comments then on your on your channel, or do you even? I think I'm very lucky in that I don't get a huge amount, and most of them are so unimaginative, it's not worth responding. Yeah. Um, a common one I get is, you're bold. <laughs> <All right>. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I'm never quite sure if that's an intel or not. If I showed them me with hair, they'd probably go, oh my God, cut yeah. it off. <laughs> um, generally, and if it's negative but constructive, I'll always take the time to respond and go, okay, thanks for pointing that out, and I'll include that in the next episode. Um, yeah. And then anything that's outrageous is usually picked up by YouTube's sensor anyway and dumped in the spam box, so yeah. Yeah. it just gets deleted. So no, I don't spend very much time or energy on any negative comments at all. No, yeah. I, I don't think anyone should. I have a, I, I do get very few as well, uh, maybe you know, once every six months or something like that. I mean, it's always an, a, a musical expert. Yes. <laughs> who, uh, who gives me advice and tells me how bad my uh, stuff was. So uh, I just, yeah, I, I, I don't respond. And I, um, what, what I do as well is I, I, I delete, I delete the comment and I, uh, I, I, yeah. I, bl- I block the person. Yeah. And I know people don't like that. They probably won't like me saying that I, uh, that I do that. But the, the, the rationale behind it is that negativity attracts negativity. So you leave that comment and you're going to you're going to have a, a hardcore fan of yours who replies to that comment and mm-hmm. then it's going to escalate and it's just going to turn very nasty with the best intention so i i don't encourage the that type of discussion on the channel i uh so i just delete straight away and uh yeah. don't let that person yeah. post again because it's just it's, it's going to upset other people it's going to attract more negativity and it's just uh, it's pointless it's a pointless exercise yeah. And I think the biggest fear I have when I put videos out is that I will give people some bad advice that they might follow and do some damage to themselves or to some systems. Um, Thankfully, I don't think I've done that so far, but just in the last couple of weeks, um, I have a Discord channel, which 
I think you use Discord yeah. as well. Discord's amazing. I only started using it a couple of months back. I'm not. Look. I'm not as good as you are on it. You're. You're very present on your Discord. <laughs> I. Uh... I I have a screen dedicated to it while I'm working in the daytime. So <laughs> I'm always in there. But there's a private room in there where I've got five people and it's like a quality control room. Ah, and they yeah. now review all my videos before I actually even put them on early access to patrons. And they've, they're of all different technical abilities. So they can say, that actually, no, if you do that, you're going to electrocute yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's bad advice, which hasn't happened yet because we've only just started using this group but hopefully that will avoid um yeah me putting anything out that i shouldn't and also in increase the quality of the videos so that's what i'm using that for yeah that's a very healthy uh, thing to do actually um, uh, having more knowledgeable people or or, or equally knowledgeable, knowledgeable people review uh, yeah. videos yeah. before that's it's, it's very, is very important yeah it, and it's very courageous as well because i i would hate that <laughs> <laughs> yeah you have to bite your tongue sometimes you know um and you have to let you know sometimes someone will say well you should have cut that shot one second earlier than that shot uh, i'm not really yeah, asking yeah, yeah. for feedback on the cinematography and no. I, I you know i am an amateur I, we can let some things slide but if I make a real boo-boo on the technical side, tell me about it, yeah. Yeah. The, my, the, one of the reasons I, I don't really look for feedback on the videos is that I, I always, maybe it's arrogant of me as well, but I, I always think that video is the best I could have done in that time. That's, that's mm -hmm. you know, or without anybody else being involved, obviously, but it's, it's I, I release it because I'm happy with it, so... Of course, it's not perfect, and of course, it can balance. be improved on it. But that balance is so important because if you want your channel to thrive, from my experience, you have to have momentum, and you only yeah. get that by releases. Yeah. So you know, I try to do one a week, sometimes two a week, but I try to guarantee one release a week. And you have to draw the line somewhere. You have yeah. to say, "This is this is the time I've got. This is the best I can do in that time." Um, and it's painful sometimes. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. And and it's funny. Um, I I I have gone through the process of reviewing a lot of my early covers as well, and and re re releasing them with what I know mm. and what I can do now. I've 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 done that, but I'm still proud of them because at the time, like I said, that was the best I could do, and that was the best uh, I could have done at the time. I always feel. Uh, it's important to remind yourself to it's not always perfect but there's such a thing as analysis analysis paralysis and uh, if you let that set in we are not gonna release anything you know yeah that's a good phrase analysis paralysis i like it <laughs> yeah if i'm working on a video for, for a week by the end of the week i'm sick of it and it's like yeah. really is is anyone really going to enjoy this <laughs> yeah 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 I'm do you, do you, fresh eyes of course do you work on just one video at a time or do you work on a few uh sometimes i'll juggle a few but generally is one at a time oh really wow yeah That's um, tough. some videos like the donations videos i can make in a day i can record it i can narrate yeah. it because i'm saying this Nintendo NES has arrived and it's yellow and I'm going to retro it and that's it. I don't need to go into the technicalities of it. Yeah. Then I move on to the next one. But anything else mm -hmm. needs a lot more research. So I try to alternate between the in-depth ones and the quick wins or the little reviews of, say, a gamepad or something like that so that I can buy myself the time to then make the big one. <laughs> you know, so I'll do the small one, put that out on a Friday, but I'll have, it, I'll have it finished on a Tuesday, ready for that Friday, and I can say, okay, I've got until next Friday now to get that next one. So, I, you know, I, I, I've got much more time to do something in depth. And then I'll follow that up with a review or a short one to buy myself some more time. So there's this constant cycle. I don't have a big queue yeah, of videos yeah. waiting to be released. I wish I did. Um, and again, if I ever went full time, I think I would just grow into the time I've got and make the same number of releases i don't think necessarily i would put more videos out i think i'd just put more into a video for the week difficult yeah yeah, hmm. yeah. I, I i work on a few at a time i always have a, a few covers running because uh, i change my mind as well very often uh, people on on my patreon will 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 know what i mean but it's just I kind of start working on something and i i suddenly i go no, no fuck it i'm, I'm, I'm gonna do this instead because 
that's in my head now and I have to do this. And um, this is kind of the way I work, it's very scattered, but I always have a few covers, about three, four covers running at the one time. Um, it's it's kind of nice because I, especially when you're doing music, you kind of get set in that, you know, you forget. Actually, it's the same with any videos. You just get so absorbed with the, the work itself and the process itself because you, you then you forget about the end result. and. So it allows me to shift and change, and then you you go back to it with fresh ears and fresh eyes, and you know it's just uh, mm -hmm. I find it works best for me. But yeah, I, I usually have three four covers going at the same time, and probably four covers in advance as well, um, in case I get busy, in case something happened, or I'm going on holidays very soon. Yeah. I, I need a few covers because I I don't want to stop, you know. Yeah. So I, I'll release them from uh, I'll schedule them and then they'll be ready to go in June. Yeah, I'd love to get in that position to uh, have a few in the bank. But um, my methods have changed since I started. So the Amiga series that you saw, I would have filmed that and narrated it without any kind of script or anything. That was just would have just been completely winged and then edited. But now I do storyboard what I'm going to make, and it has it has made it quicker to make the videos. But again, I've just grown into that time and just <laughs> made yeah. the videos longer um so, so yeah do you script much of it then i will very roughly storyboard the story that i want to to make for the video i'll film it and then i'll um, edit the video down to the storyboard and then i'll script it but it will always be a very rough script so that I, I can hopefully come across a bit more naturally than just reading a script. Mm. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, the, I always have the video finished before I then put the voiceover on it. Yeah. Wow. And if you ever watched my raw footage, you'll hear me muttering away as I'm filming. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, remember to talk about this. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it does take a lot of time. I know on my second channel, I, I used to script a lot of stuff for my uh, MSX reviews, and I had to stop. I just don't have the time. So what you, what, you, what people are getting on that channel is raw, raw footage all the way through. <laughs> um, I, I try to edit the cursing out of it, but yeah, that's about it. Uh, but it's time consuming. It's so time consuming. Uh, 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 scripting and, and storyboarding like you do as well and people don't realize it is especially uh, on the russian example i gave as soon as you fall down that rabbit hole of well why didn't russia have computers oh because yeah. oh, there was an embargo on them being imported why was that you know oh because they were using them to develop submarines why was that and you just get ah and it's just so much information i know but it's so uh, interesting that's what makes a, a story actually interesting i i find it's all the uh, yeah but that has to be scripted yeah you have to, have to script research. it so do you do much research then mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yeah um so at the moment it's for this jackie chan computer and yeah, um, i'm looking forward to that i'm i'm, I'm very curious now you have a well, I've got Chairman Mao wearing a Super Mario hat at one point, so you can enjoy that little animation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Is that your own stuff, your own... Uh... That's mine. I'm, I'm experimenting because I think if you're making a video about China, you can't make it too crazy or wacky. You'll never be up to their crazy standards. Yeah. <laughs> so we've got made a few animations, yeah. I used yeah. to do like an aesthetic uh, drawings for my MSX reviews, like a small Ollie guy. Um, I, in various stances and explaining stuff. Um, I, I Again, it takes so long to do this. I, I have to stop. I'm not sure if I can bring it up. What's your, um, what's your outlook and plan for the channel? The plan is to just keep doing what I'm doing. At the nice. moment, it's still growing. Keep growing. I don't have any new formats I want to introduce. I, I want to keep pushing the podcast. I, I don't plan on making a separate channel for the podcast at the moment. Uh, but we'll see how that's received and we've yeah. got some really good guests lined up um, and I've got a whole queue of donated computers to work through so we won't be short of content I just need to make sure I use my time wisely to get it out there yeah nice yeah the, the podcast is going to be interesting I'm really looking forward to the other uh, episodes because um, you do have really nice guests at the moment if, if the last one is anything to uh, go no sorry the um well the last two ones in fact yeah 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 so we've got we had beast from cortex yeah and... the one that's out there at the moment is dan slopes from yeah. slopes game room he's a youtuber 
and then I want to try and alternate. I don't. We have another content creator who um, we're making an episode with, but I don't want to put them out back to back. I want to try and mix it up a bit. So we've got two game developers, one new and one old school, um, who we're going to interview. So I'm really looking forward to getting an, an insight into those worlds. One's from the Amiga world as well, so it'd be great to hear about games development on the Amiga. So we'll try and alternate that with the other content creator. But yeah, plenty plenty lined up and plenty to come. Yeah, That's very cool. Yeah, I, I try to do something similar. I have content creators and, and, and you know, influential people in the industry or former, you know, members of the industry at some point. Mm. Um, alternating, you know, like that. And actually, this thing is not just gaming either. So um, hopefully, hopefully it'll find an audience. I had to move it away from my channel, though, because it was just too different from the uh, music stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah that's uh, it's very different, which is strange because you don't necessarily have to watch your videos to enjoy your music on your other channel. It is primarily you know an audio experience yeah so you think a podcast would be more compatible uh, i i don't know it, it is what it is i i was i i was adamant i wasn't going to move it from the channel first and then uh, i i i went back and forth i i do think because it's so different i don't want it to just ride on the channel either and uh, and i think it needs to find its own audience and niche and that kind of stuff but in your case i think your podcast is best left on your channel because like you said it's a channel with different yeah. programs uh, my 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 main channel was just revolved around the music uh, yeah so the podcast is too different to keep it there anyway um patreon if uh, if you want to people want to help your channel directly and, and likewise for Oli. <laughs> <laughs> this thing is not about me. Uh, Patreon, uh, uh, you're on Facebook. If you want to plug all your... Yes, indeed. Uh, Facebook, um, Discord. If you look on the description of any of my recent videos, you'll find my Discord channel. And there's about 300 people there, all like-minded computer fixer-uppers with sub-rooms for pretty much every system you can think of. They're all helping each other out. So come on to Discord. Um, but yeah, YouTube is really where it all happens. Um, come and find me, Retro Man Cave, on YouTube. Yeah. Subscribe, like, all of that stuff. And um, I know I'm bald, so no bald comments, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, should, we should recall this episode, the Bald Bearded Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> the Upside Down Heads. But yeah, uh, yeah we leave all the links in the comments, folks. And then send me your uh, Discord, I don't know, the link or invite. I don't think I, I have it. I'm in it, but I'm not sure how to retrieve that. So uh, send me that. Um, Neil, uh, Retro Man Cave, dude, thank you very much. It was very, very pleasant uh, chatting to you um, I know these can be a bit awkward I don't have an agenda I don't have a script for these it's it's a free chat but uh, thank you very much for uh, for taking the time and uh, we'll talk again thank you Ollie thanks for having me and uh, thank you to anyone out there who watched <laughs> see ya cheers bye nice <laughs>